Hi guys, my name is San Jacob Ta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to do a video on the subject of myocardial bridges. Now this is something that a lot of people have asked me to talk about and I've been promising them for a while. The first thing to say is that the heart is a muscle, okay, and any muscle needs a blood supply. And in the heart, the blood supply is through three main arteries called the coronary arteries. And the purpose of these vessels is to try and get oxygen-rich blood to different parts of the heart. Normally, these coronary arteries sit on the top of the heart, okay? So they, they sit at the surface of the heart and the blood can go through and through little tiny, tiny little perforating vessels, the blood gets to where it needs to. Once in a while, what you will see is that a blood vessel, instead of just sitting at the top of the heart, for a little part of its course, actually goes into the heart muscle. So it tunnels into the heart muscle, so that the muscle sits on top of the vessel, and then it comes out at another point. So a part of the blood vessel goes down, tunnels into the heart muscle, and then comes out. Okay, and that is called a myocardial bridge where you've got heart muscle sitting on top of this blood vessel through for a small portion of its course. The problem here is this, that theoretically you may think, well, okay, what will happen? When the heart muscle contracts, then there is a possibility that as the heart muscle is contracting, it would squeeze this intramyocardial portion of the blood vessel. And if it squeezes this, it could compress it. If it compresses it, then it means that blood, oxygen-rich blood, cannot get to the heart muscle, and therefore muscle cells would suffocate and die, and that could cause damage, and that's what you would think. The interesting thing, however, is that what we now know is that actually most of the filling of the heart vessels occurs when the heart is relaxing. So even though you have this bridge which may become significant when the heart compresses, actually most of the blood flow happens when the heart is relaxing in diastole. Okay? So even though we see this kind of thing, in practice it doesn't seem to affect too many people because all the filling of the heart arteries is when the heart is relaxing, not when the heart is contracting. However, there is no doubt that in a small proportion of patients, myocardial bridges have been associated with bad things happening. They can cause, they've been implicated in symptoms of angina, they've been implicated in symptoms of coronary artery spasm, they've been implicated in symptoms of sudden heart attack, also sometimes sudden death. But this is only in a minority of patients. Nevertheless, it's important and that's why I'm talking about it. The first thing to say is how common are these myocardial bridges, okay? Uh, if you look at autopsy specimen, you will find that up to 42% of patients will have at least a small proportion of their blood vessel going through an intramyocardial segment. These may be so small that they are not visualized on other non-invasive tests, but on autopsy up to 42%. In terms of non-invasive tests, the best test to look for them is probably something called cardiac CT or coronary angiography. In those 25 to 30 percent of patients will have a small intramyocardial segment. So myocardial bridges are very common. They tend to occur largely in the LAD area. The LAD is the main blood vessel that goes around the front of the heart and that's where the majority of bridges are found. Now, the question is, okay, so if it's this common, why is it sometimes implicated in a small minority of people with uh, really, you know, heart attacks, sudden death, uh, coronary artery spasm, etc.? And for this, we have to look at autopsy specimens to see exactly what happens when this, heart, this vessel is going through an intramyocardial portion. What we find is that these patients where, who have myocardial bridges, just proximal, just where the blood vessel goes into the intermyocardial segment, where it starts tunneling in, we see a lot more uh, likelihood of atheroma developing there. So it seems that for some reason the forces, the, the way the hemodynamics of blood are altered as this vessel goes through this segment causes or stimulates inflammation around the vessel just before it goes in. And that inflammation manifests as atheroma or crud. And so that is something we find. And actually what we then find is that when you look further down here and when it comes out, there is no crud. So it seems that there's something going on here 
The hemodynamics of blood are altered in such a way that crud can form there. We also think that when this crud forms, it releases biochemical mediators, inflammatory mediators, and that those mediators can actually sometimes cause coronary spasms. So there is a chance that you can release chemicals which can actually cause this vessel which is going in to go into spasm here. And those may be the mechanisms which underlie why these patients get these symptoms. A, if you've got crud developing here, then a bit of crud can break off. Uh, when the bit of crud breaks off, uh, the, the body thinks you've sustained a wound and will form a blood clot. And that blood clot could then inadvertently block the vessel at all times, whether it be when the heart is relaxing or contracting, and that causes a heart attack. So that's one mechanism. Another mechanism is if you have release of these inflammatory mediators, they can cause the heart vessel to go into spasm, stop the blood from getting through, and that can cause damage to the heart muscle, so coronary artery spasm. That's another mechanism. So the next question is, well, how do you diagnose it? Well, diagnosis is not difficult. Diagnosis is not difficult because they're so common. We see them in so many patients. The more challenging thing is to try and work out whether that bridge is responsible for the patient's symptoms of angina or the heart attack or the coronary artery spasm. That's far more challenging. And so for that, what you have to do is do a coronary angiogram to look at the heart arteries, to look at all the heart arteries, to make sure there is no other cause, there's no other narrowing, proper fixed narrowing, which is causing the patient's symptoms. If you don't find any other cause and you see a bridge, then trying to evaluate it functionally in some way can help determine whether that is the cause of the symptoms. So how do you do that? Well, what you can do is do something called pressure wire studies or flow reserve studies. What you can do is you can insert a little wire which measures the pressure just before this vessel goes into the tunnel, right? So you can measure the pressure here. You can then push this catheter in and measure the pressure on the other side. And you can then calculate a ratio. And the, the lower the ratio, okay, the more, it's called the FFR value, the lower the FFR value, the more likely it is that you're getting a lot of blood coming here, but very little on this side, the pressures here are different to here, substantially different, and that points to the fact that maybe this is a significant narrowing, this is causing a true reduction in the blood supply of the heart beyond it, and that will tell you that this is significant. The magic value for this FFR thing is 0.75. So if you have something, if you have values over 0.75, then it means it's probably not so significant. If it's a lot below 0.75, or if it's a lot below 0.75, makes it more likely that this bridge, this bit of heart muscle covering this vessel is actually causing a substantial reduction in the blood flow distally to the heart. Uh, and that is how you make the diagnosis of a significant bridge which may be responsible for the symptoms. Next question is, well, how do you treat it? Well, there are three uh, ways you can treat this. The first is using medicines, tablets. The second is to put in a stent, so you can actually go in and blow this area open so that there's no risk of it being compressed with a stent or finally heart surgery. I'll just talk to you about medications first. In terms of medications, the commonly used medications are beta blockers. Beta blockers slow the heart down. When they slow the heart down, they give the heart more time to relax. Remember, blood flow is maximal in these coronary arteries when the heart is relaxing. So if you increase the amount of uh, time for the heart to relax, more blood gets through. So that's one thing. Of course, if a person was getting angina, just slowing the heart down will reduce the demands of the heart and that will help as well. The problem with beta blockers is some people who have spasm because of this, in those people, beta blockers can make that spasm worse. So they're not for everyone. And if I had a patient with a symptomatic myocardial bridge, I would say, well, here's a trial of beta blockers. But if your symptoms get worse, maybe the beta blocker is making your spasm worse and therefore it's not for you. The second option, as I said, was to put in stents. The third option is surgery, in which you can actually either do a bypass, so you can put another vessel from the leg and bypass this narrowing, or uh, not narrowing, bypass the bridged portion. The problem with this is that, that if it is not truly narrowed, if the, the bridge is not truly causing a substantial narrowing, blood will continue going down the, 
the bridge portion and therefore it will not go down the bypass portion and the bypass will fail. And that is why it has to be very carefully thought out and you have to be sure that the bridge portion is really narrow and if it is then blood will be encouraged to go down the bypass and the bypass will you know, uh, be preserved over a period of time. Uh, a better way to try and uh, perform surgery in these patients is something called de-unroofing. So just cutting the muscle on top of the blood vessel to free the blood vessel from the intramyocardial thing can also be effective. And that is probably the only treatment that has been shown to be quite beneficial in, these, in patients with myocardial bridges. So if you, are, if you have uh, symptoms, the first thing is obviously to have an angiogram, make sure there's nothing else that is the cause because myocardial bridges are common. What you have to be confident of is that the bridge is responsible for the symptoms. If the bridge is indeed responsible for the symptoms, then the thing I would recommend is to go and see a, um, someone who has an interest in this, a surgeon, and talk to him about potential unroofing of this myocardial bridge portion which can result in improvement. There was a study several years ago in Stanford University where they found that quality of life scores in patients with myocardial bridges uh, went up from say 25% to 78% after unroofing of the myocardial bridge. So in those people who are really struggling with symptoms of chest discomfort, there is a really good possibility that surgery could improve quality of life. But this has to be done with careful discussion with the surgeon and making sure that the bridge is really, truly the cause of the problems. So I hope you found this useful. Um, and once again, thank you to all those people who requested this video. Once again, thank you so much for all that you do for me. All the best.